I had the strange thought this morning. Um, I think it's because I, I'm reading that book that talk about someone had written things 300 years before Castaneda and it's the yeah. same thing and yeah. that Castaneda wrote like and it's just I, I, I was just thinking that everything is everybody's opinions on things you find a, an earlier source of that opinion and then it's another opinion it, it feels like everything is just opinions when do we actually get to any truth of anything if there is any it, it just felt like well, it's all opinions I'm not talking about science and that kind of thing but the truth of it all the bigger truth of where we come from where we're going and we die or the, the, the spiritual truth the bigger truth what is it? Because it's... You just keep getting to the points that it's just opinions. Opinions and experiences that belong to those people that had the opinions. And it's not really anything factual, is it? You're getting an essential philosophical point. Yeah. Especially in Western philosophy. Right. Yeah. Which is... You... you, you hit on one direction of the resolution of it. And that is experience. <coughs> However, Western philosophy is always, not only Western philosophy, but especially Western philosophy has always been a bit unreliable because someone with an experience and and then expressing their interpretation of that experience someone else may have a somewhat or very similar experience and interpret it differently yeah so where's the flaw or where's the weakness or the vulnerability in that that, that completely has to do with the consciousness of the experiencer that if the consciousness of the if the consciousness of the experiencer doesn't support complete clarity of the experience and clarity of the expression of the experience then the consciousness is 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 uns, it doesn't provide a good foundation an adequate foundation which means that until we are enlightened, we don't know shit. Well, because... Yes, you're right. It, it essentially means that... Both the... I'll put it in somewhat simplistic ways because of the way I've heard Marjorie express it. If you're 75% enlightened, or you can say 75% stress-free, or however you want to put it, then your experience is going to be 75% accurate. I mean, you're 75% complete. And also, your interpretation or expression of that is going to be only 75% accurate and complete. Right. Um, doesn't mean that those the experiences of those who well, and here's the kind of the kind of um, I don't want to say exception but almost a dilemma in that consideration is that because of the of a of a unique configuration of the nervous system. And when I, in this case, when I say nervous system, it's a combination of everything going on in the body and mind and everything, you know. Mm -hmm. Because of whatever unique condition of the nervous system might be going on at the time of that experience, whatever that big experience was, 
that experience, that flash of an experience, can be very true and accurate. But it is never 100% true and accurate until you're 100% there and that level of consciousness. So you can actually, you know, there are there are understandings that that people who have, have had flashes of celestial experiences and enlightened experiences and unity experiences and all that that are you could even say ninety nine percent accurate and yeah. true. That remaining one percent actually is a big deal. It's not, you know, it's when you're talking about the experience of infinity and of near infinity, when you're talking about celestial and all that, then then that additional one percent it's not linear. It's it's I forget the term, but it's um, that additional one percent isn't just one percent of of the you know, of the of the ninety ninety nine plus one. You know, it's not that because because the experience of infinity which requires never ends. Yeah, well, yeah, that's eternity. Yeah, but the experience of infinity can only be had when you are owning that infinity. And so, if you're getting ninety nine percent of that, it's not the infinity you're right, getting. Right. Even though it is remarkably huge in that experience, and then and then you go into. What is the condition of the nervous system at the time that the individual is expressing it, whether it's in words or in writing or however, sharing? If it's not, well, I shouldn't say that if it's not, to whatever extent the individual's nervous system is there, yeah. that's the quality of the accuracy that is going to be expressed. And so the individual could be 75, 85 percent, 99 percent there when they have the experience, but only 70% or 50% there when they're expressing it. So that goes through the filter of the physiology that is, that is now even less clear. And that's been a dilemma for the poets and the philosophers and other writers for years, is that they never feel they can give full expression to their experience, even when the experience wasn't 100%. Yeah. And they get very frustrated about it all, justifiably. But so, but the resolution to this is, you know, obviously, you know, the simplest way of looking at the resolution to all this is that, you know, you get enlightened. Um, but when you can find a great amount of similarities in the expressions of these experiences among those who have been considered to be either enlightened or just simply highly evolved, then there's a greater degree of likelihood of truth and accuracy in it. Um, there was a certain point where Maharishi was, was advising us not to read any of the Vedic literature um, for a variety of reasons, but largely because, but one in this particular example, because so many of the translations and commentaries have been done over the centuries by unenlightened people. Then later, as we progressed, not just as teachers, but and governors and all that, but as just you know people meditating on, he he essentially said, we have enough experience in our own consciousness to know when truth is resonating. You know, now this, had, this was specifically to do with the Vedic texts. Right. But some of that can be applied to, to other writings and philosoph philosophies and such. But the other thing that gets, that, that com complicates this issue when it comes to the Vedic texts is that Many, if not most, of them, um, as is probably true with all scripture, has its exoteric value and within it its esoteric value. And so it is the it is the 
specialized ability of those who are growing in consciousness to experience and feel and recognize, and in some cases make commentary and interpret, the esoteric value. Those who aren't moving along well in their consciousness no. are, are just going to be playing with interpretations of the exoteric, the sur more surface values. Even if they are expressing like, oh, this is what the deeper meaning is, if they're not doing so well in terms of their consciousness, they're, they're never going to see it, what the true deeper meanings are. It's one of the problems with interpretations of, well, if we're more familiar with interpretations of the Bible, is that you're going to have people who are finding deeper meanings in the, in the Bible, and they may be deeper metaphorical meanings, but is it the true esoteric meaning? value that is there. Yeah. I remember Charlie talking about Jagged Lips. Yeah. Talking about the term Holy Bible means the whole truth. And that there are many layers of that truth. Or the whole story, the whole truth, whatever. And did, and he, he and others have cautioned them to basically say, well, here's what the words mean, and then here's what the metaphor of the words mean. That's just going down one layer. These, the scriptures tend to have a value in helping one grow in not just understanding, but in actual experience of higher states, all scriptures. But when is it good to read the Yoga Vashishta? When is it good to read the Brahma Sutras? You know, um, for, uh, the Brahma Sutras are a good example. The Brahma Sutras, the way I understand it, have very little value until you're about to get into Brahman consciousness. And yet they're studied and they're read and they're interpreted and the commentary is made on it and they're beautiful and all these different things. But that's not, that isn't their primary purpose. Their primary purpose is to help one transition from that exalted state of unity consciousness into that Brahman consciousness. So, but most, um, most scholars would basically look at the Brahma Sutras as essentially just another Vedic text that they teach about Brahman consciousness. And it's true, it does. But, that wasn't the principal reason for them being cognized and, and shared. So, you know, obviously I'm more familiar with that area, but I believe all these principles still apply to whatever expressions of experiences of deeper things. And so, Then you get into the whole confirmation bias area, you know, that, that you, and I'm guilty of it as much as anybody else because I think it's a byproduct of not being enlightened, a constant byproduct of that. So, so over the years of our lives we've become, we enjoy and then tend to, because we enjoy we tend to believe descriptions of certain realms of living, in this case, the celestial realm, fairies, angels, all these different things. And there are things that we love to hear and read about and, and all that. And so we naturally look to read and hear about those things that confirm that love in yeah. that way. So we stay as if trapped in that concept. In a way, because you're always trapped within that behavior. concepts before you're experiencing them in their fullness. And the experience of, of anything is always going to be bigger than the writings or the descriptions or the opinions of the, such a thing. We're going to extrapolate and kind of 
Wallen from one of the analogies that Maharishi was loving to use a lot. He didn't quite use it in this way, but I think it still applies. You can tell a man about a strawberry. Beautiful red color, delicious juiciness, this and this and this and this. And, this. and and some will just enjoy hearing and looking at strawberries. You know, so look how beautiful it is. They're, 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 you know, I'll open it up, look how juicy it is. But until the man, I'm just saying the man, but until the person actually tastes the strawberry, they are stuck, as you just said, in the understanding of the descriptions of the strawberry. Yeah. And it's helpful to have those understandings. Because without the intellectual understanding, the we can't the intellect is all about choosing. This not that. This and that. That's you know, it's all about choosing. To discriminate between A and B or and to know when it's good to have A and B. You know, it's all about those things. You can't have a functioning intellect without having some understanding of those variables. What is A, what is B, etc. So it's very helpful to have these understandings. But without actually tasting the strawberry, you're, you're limited. Regardless of how much you can learn about the molecular structure of the strawberry and how the different colors manifest from when and how and when the sun hits and all these different things, you can have all these great levels of knowledge. You can have almost at infinitum levels of knowledge about a thing or an experience. But still, you're, you're stuck in that understanding, not, not and, and, and you're stuck because it isn't complemented by the experience. Then Marjorie would go on to say, in this example, and he was using it in a different way, but again, is that all of the understanding would lead to the person saying, ah, yes, then I want to taste the strawberry. And then the tasting of the strawberry leads to the, the desire of knowing intellectually and experientially. Well, what if I put a strawberry with some whipped cream? What if I put a strawberry in a pot? What if I put the strawberry along with blueberries? You know, and then ate, then tasted all that. So it, the intellectual understanding naturally leads to the decision of how and when to experience, and if to experience. So there's nothing wrong with the intellectual understanding, mm -hmm. but it, it is never complete. And when when something is never complete, and we're staying in something that's never complete, we're stuck, as you referenced. You, you used the word. So, but you have to experience for yourself. But that doesn't even mean you're going to experience everything, and the reality that it, it truly is, because you're not enlightened. Right. <laughs> but, but, but not, yes, but not having yeah. the enlightened experience, the full experience of it, shouldn't diminish. Th diminish or prevent you from having more and more experiences. And, and essentially, it should drive you to having more and more experiences if it's a healthy, good thing to have. And I think this was part of the issue. I mean, this is a sort of a deviation of the discussion, but. This is part of the issue that has been problematic from my life, in my lifetime, it probably goes before this as well, of the hippie philosophies, perspectives, and the new age perspectives, is that I sum it up as the problem with if it feels good, do it. Oh. But, but it's more than that. It's a, if it's possible to experience, then let's experience it. That's a problem with science as well. If it's possible to create something, we should create it and see what happens. It's not always good. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a dilemma because in a lot of ways the only really real way to know or a better way to know if something is good to do is by doing it. Sometimes it's very difficult to know that something isn't good. It's like, you 
not so long ago, science developed a way to genetically modify mosquitoes so that they essentially, I think the logic behind it was that, that if they introduced these genetically modified mosquitoes into the mosquito population, the genetic, because the genetically modified mosquitoes that were, they were introducing could not um, sustain the carrying of certain diseases, where the non-genetically modified ones could, then they, the scientists believe, and probably accurately, that it would eventually dilute the gene pool of the, of the non-genetically modified mosquitoes so that few, if any, would ever be able to carry these diseases. Right. So on many levels, that sounds like a great thing. But on another level, what happens, and it's all speculation, what would happen if the new gene pool over many generations of mosquitoes developed a tolerance to that and started being able to actually carry worse diseases because everything is about adaptation, you know. You know. That's the, you know, those are the concerns. You know, when I first saw those stories, I, I said, and I think others said, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Everything. You know, yeah, right. It's, you know, but maybe not. But the problem with that is that we may not know for many, many years if it's a problem. So do you do it? And this has been part of the argument of that the somewhat uninformed and uneducated anti-vax people have been. There's, you know, their argument has been, well, an inaccurate argument, which lacks foundation. Your argument has been, how can these new breed of vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that have been used for COVID, been created so quickly and not be problematic, potentially a big problem? Well, the fact is they weren't created just for COVID-19. They, they've been in development for decades. So that argument breaks down. But that argument still, still is used well, how is it that they magically came up with all this stuff so quickly just to address COVID-19? They were motivated to do so because of the scope of, of, if you actually bring it forward, because of the scope of the problem of COVID-19. And therein also could be a problem because how much testing was actually done? You know, The way the science justifies these things is saying, well, even if there are some people that experience negative side effects from the vaccine, the risk reward ratio is completely out of whack because the number of people who are their lives are going to be saved because of the vaccine, and also your symptoms from getting a new vaccine are nothing compared to dying or being hospitalized yeah i think i think i the vaccine saved my life because it was very bad when we got covid mm -hmm. if i hadn't been vaccinated i'd be dead but you can see how people who are afraid or have lacked some critical thinking and, and, you know, if they heard about your experience or if they had your experience, they, they would confuse correlation with causation and say, well, look, she got the vaccine. She didn't get a severe case of COVID, but then she got cancer. So therefore, the vaccine... No, no, I think that the seriousness of COVID, that, that my lungs had water in them. Mm -hmm. I, th I, I think that was COVID. I don't even think that was that was the cancer because... After I had the Flonax and the tube, and then it didn't stay that long. It stayed, you know, less time than normal for what I was going through. I and then they took it out, and I, I, my lungs didn't produce any more liquid or anything. I think because my immune system is not that great, I guess, because of cancer. I think, the, I think cancer was already there. I just didn't know because you're point. supposed not to even... Cancer doesn't hurt. Yeah, as a rule. You don't I mean, even know it's there. Yeah. And I think it was already there, and it's still there, and 
I'm breathing fine. I'm almost, I think I'd say I'm 99% normal now. Yeah. After almost a year, it was October last year, now it's in August. I know. And. Uh, I was reflecting, but I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 uh, but I, I think all that problem, all that, what, all that stuff, I think that was COVID that caused that. I, I think that. Well, probably aggravated the cancer to cause that, but. It could have been much worse if I wasn't vaccinated, I think. I agree with you. I think those tumorettes or whatever was the proper, you know, they were there. And and then the COVID aggravated something in the lungs that made your lungs... Want to shut down. Yeah, and, and so the combination of those little tumor things and the lining of your lungs, you know, if you didn't, yeah, get, but COVID, if you didn't get COVID, you probably would have not been aware of any discomfort until much later, much later. So, yes it yeah. aggravated everything of yeah. course so if anything covid helped us get on to this quicker I, yes we but i think if i didn't have had the vaccines yeah yeah, then would, yeah i agree with you yeah it probably would have killed me i was thinking the other night well it wasn't so long ago that you had the pleurics you know, the, no we took it out to what in april i don't remember it was about two months, right? Yeah. Maybe a little more than two months because they took, they had weeks, they had to wait weeks to take it out yeah, because yeah. the doctor didn't have yeah. a but, time. You know, I, I was just reflecting on, yeah. on how recently and how much you've gone through. Yes, because they, they it was put on in January. Yeah. January yeah. or February. And we took it out in, in sometime the end of March. That's what I thought. Yeah, I thought or it was beginning March, of April. Yeah. So but it's quite actually remarkable how far you've come. Months. Exactly. So, and I think the key in terms of even though it months feels like a very long time to be sick. Well, that much. Yeah. Right. I think the key to, especially yours, but mine as well, how we're doing, how we're feeling, and how vital we can be, is by progressively not watching anything, especially for you. We need, as we become healthier in terms of general health, losing weight, becoming more active and all yeah, that, exactly. we're going to know a whole lot better how strong we each are, you know, in terms of resiliency and all that. 